Excellent. Welcome everyone to the Metasploit demo meeting for March 26, 2018. Uh, we've not had a demo in about a month now, so we've got a lot to cover. Let's dive right in. In the past, we've highlighted our top contributors, but I wanted to take a moment to showcase our new contributors. We've had a lot of pull requests over the last month, so I apologize to anyone I missed. But uh, Una Piva Geek submitted an HSTS eraser module that I'll talk about in just a little bit. And Dubfree had a Jira authenticated plugin module this month. Uh, we've got several more in the pipe, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and then for our top five contributors, you notice a lot of names. Uh, Brent, the all time reigning champion of the <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with, with, you know, everyone else trailing uh, in a, the distant second, third, fourth, fifth, or, you know, me not on the list anywhere. So, you know, well, something to aspire to. Yeah, not to be the anomaly. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you're the outlying data point. <laughs> <laughs> I must be deleted from the results. Yes. yes. Uh, okay, so big announcement. Uh, Metasploit's been accepted to the Google Summer of Code. Uh, and so for those of you who haven't uh, kept up with that, this is an opportunity for students to work on some really cool projects, uh, and there's a lot of flexibility as to what that might be. Uh, so we've had some folks that actually came into the Slack channel to kind of talk to us about uh, Google Summer of Code, and that's been awesome. I know folks kind of have their own ideas too. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, um, hopefully we'll have some really good con con contributors. I think that we've had a lot of also the new contributors of Fixes to Flight. At least a few of those have actually been uh, people aspiring to work on the Google Summer of Code as well. Yep. So I just want to call out uh, student submissions are opening uh, in the next few days here. So March 12th through 27th. Doesn't give a lot of time, but uh, definitely summercode.withgoogle.com. Uh, check out the program uh, by jump in. Uh, it's not with us with somebody, but you should do it with us. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also want to call out, uh, we've got a new blog series going on. Semper Victus uh, has uh, stepped up to write uh, his, his, he's got so much history with the project and Brent, you know him a lot better than I do. Yeah, um, yeah, he's been working with the project for, I think, five, near on five years and uh, um, he's a little bit of our institutional memory as well. So it's always nice to have him give his own unique perspective on things and uh, someday I'm going to see that really amazing mess with fork he's got up there to the side and see what <laughs> that amazing stuff's in there. But he's been slowly trickling it back mm -hmm. to us, so it's really, uh, Awesome effort from his point of view. He's also uh, tends to be the first person uh, to yeah. sort of pull in random commits that everyone else is scared to merge yes. and, uh, and see how they work. Yeah. So this is a new effort by Caitlin, our community manager, and uh, I know that she would love if, uh, if other folks in the community want to step up and have ideas or want to contribute a post. So I've got her email address up there too. Uh, all right. Uh, in addition, new YouTube videos. Uh, so I know Matthew made uh, a Eternal Romance, kind of an M17010, eternal, uh, what, Eternal Romance, Eternal Synergy, Eternal Champion, uh, which covers quite a wide range of Windows environments, and it's a really good walkthrough in terms of uh, what the exploit can do and, and how it works. Uh, so that YouTube video was up a couple weeks ago. Uh, and then just today, uh, Pierce pushed out our uh, Swift Keylogger uh, metal extension video, uh, which is pretty cool. It's a really slick keylogger for OSX. That, uh, well, you're welcome to talk about it, but I, I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> well, it came from GitHub. The, the core of the code came from GitHub users through everything, and it is a really slick keylogger. Uh, we wrapped it to make it a metal extension. It actually links with our metal uh, library that we compile, and it captures keystrokes uh, per application. So it'll tell you which application the user was typing in. It captures when applications are started and stopped, and whenever keyboard type devices are connected or removed from the system. So you get quite a bit of information, a bit of information from our from from that via our metal our uh, positive interpreter. So mm -hmm. it's 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 in PR right now, but hopefully we'll it soon. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. So as I mentioned, it's been a full month since we've done one of these, and so we've had a lot of things that have landed in that time. Um, I'm happy to pause if anybody wants to to discuss anything I missed, but I kind of bolted the ones that, that jumped out to me. Um, so. Uh, was it Will that was working on the Asus? Uh, no, wait. Was yeah. that, that was you, Brendan? Yeah. Sorry, the Asus WRT LAN uh, remote code execution. Um, so I don't know. If it, that was uh, that got sent in by uh, one of our community members, who's absolutely phenomenal at doing those uh, uh, sort of the embedded device uh, exploits and tools. Uh, that was Pedro, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and we brought it in. We're able to test it. Uh, Asus was actually really awesome because uh, I called them out specifically in the PR because 
in addition to having the most up-to-date firmware, they actually had all of the previous firmwares right there ready for testing. It was really kind of amazing because, you know, heaven forbid if you ever need to get some router hardware for the firmware, you, you have to go to, like, creepy sites and download from, you know, we're, we're, I, w I won't say any particular uh, <laughs> region of, of the world that you have to go to and lurk and find old binaries and uh, do all kinds of weird things. But Asus was straight up awesome. I got the original firmware that I needed, was able to back the, back the router back and get the testing done. So it was really cool. Sweet. And since you already had one in your vast router lab at home, uh, actually, no, I had to order that one. Oh, wow. It was like 15 bucks on Amazon. Okay. So, you know. Add, add it to the, to the army. The things I do for less. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Uh, so I got I got mixed up before. I think it was Will who was working on the uh, Netgear Color Table uh, for the show. That's right. Uh, this is an interesting one in that it's uh, actually it's a feature. And <laughs> they still actually ship with their routers, where basically you send a magic packet with a particular hash generated. And um, it turns on telnet for you, and oh, you can be able to log in as root to the router. Very considerate. Is, is Will in the room now? Uh, he's he's hiding. Yeah, 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 he's hiding. He's right. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, so it's a pretty fun thing. It's been, I think, I think we've been working on this uh, for about maybe five years or so, uh, just trying to get it. Actually, the, the, the challenge was the OpenSSL bindings and root don't allow enough bytes to be hashed to actually generate the the, the cryptographic hash needed to uh, generate the magic packet. But um, I, I believe what we did was uh, actually just implement the whole thing in Ruby. Uh, okay. Sure, and then that was able to work. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's a fun thing, and it's yeah. it's it'll never be patched. There's actually not even a CV on it because it's a feature uh, <laughs> and not a product. Apparently, <laughs> good. All right. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I know we've got a couple scanner modules as well. Uh, Memcached has been making the the the, the press lately uh, mm -hmm. in terms of just. A lot of uh, uh, distributed denial service attacks that have been wandering around. So we've got a uh, scanner for that, uh, for Memcached D amplification, uh, and then robot scanner. Uh, I believe we'll have a demo of a little bit later, hopefully. Uh, and so that's that was a definitely a big one that I know Adam spent a lot of time working on. Well, something interesting to know about these yeah. two of those scanners is that they use a new um, infrastructure in Metasploit uh, called Coldstone, which allows modules to run externally to Metasploit. Um, one of the, the neat, neat features of this as well is that in addition to having improved performance, the ability to write uh, modules in different languages, um, also run in Sonar, which is Rapid Sense uh, Internet Line Scanning Architecture. So uh, these modules actually can plug right into Sonar and run straight from there as well. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so we've had a number of new uh, pre modules jump up. Uh, and if anybody wants to chat about these, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to you know, for folks that have more experience on them. Uh, the one that kind of jumped out to me was the uh, abort privilege escalation, which was against Fedora that uh, took, uh, took advantage of a race condition to create an account on the system. Takes a little bit of time, but it uh, looks like it worked pretty well, and that, that uh, definitely was kind of a little bit interesting. Uh, a bit of a unique attack that you don't see every day. Mm -hmm. well, one of the interesting things that always uh, cracked me up about a lot of the glibc bugs is that there are just so many um, features in glibc that are just off by default, but they're little tunable knobs you can set it like, like LD audit, which uh, basically allows you to uh, turn on auditing of what GLC is doing and then you're able to escalate privileges there. Oh, wait, that doesn't sound so nice. Um, there's actually another really cool one that I just found out about this week, which I've maybe tried model for as well, but you basically touch a file that will cause it to stop checking if set UID is set or not. Um, you, you touch a special file on Etsy, and then uh, all these set UID checks get turned off. It's like a set UID debug or something like that. Okay. And it's also Ships by default, and uh, catch it. There you go. Maintain persistent, make all your set UID binaries work incorrectly. Nice. That's great. Good. Okay. Good job, yeah. you see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and still more. Uh, so we have a number, a number of other kind of what I would consider miscellaneous some post exploitation modules. Uh, one I want to call out from our uh, uh, first first time contributor, Uno PB Geek, was the uh, HSTS eraser. Uh, so I think she was she was frustrated that apparently some browsers, when you're browsing to uh, TLS enabled sites, will use HSTS to remember certificates, and so uh, she didn't want that uh, cache to to live anymore because she wouldn't be sniffing on that traffic. So uh, so now we have a post exploit module that will go through and, and clear HSTS from Chrome and Firefox uh, and uh, even WCAT because she's just that thorough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't WCAT any HSTS I support. Mean, I mean, me neither. Yeah. <laughs> What about curl? Is it the same? I don't know. Uh, yeah. 
some for the, for, uh, for the future. Uh, and then we've had a number of just kind of updates to existing modules. Uh, one I'll call out is OWA login. I know our, our Intel pen test team was very excited about this, so I'm sure uh, the community will as well. But adding OWA uh, 2016 support in Pierce, I think that was your fault. Uh, <laughs> no, that was Brent's fault. Oh, was it Brent? Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Obviously, I should be yeah. fault to Brent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's my fault at some level. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Uh, but but an interesting thing is uh, the, the older versions of OWA, basically if you have a valid user or if you don't have a valid user, there's a timing oracle that uh, you can basically see how long it takes for the, the, the server to respond if it takes longer than the user didn't exist. Um, so the newer versions of OWA, they, they, they broke the oracle. It's terrible. Oh. <laughs> and so uh, the, the, the support made it look, look. But rather than saying the user exists because uh, it came back fast and said, it just said, I can't really tell at the moment. Okay. Very cool. Uh, and then kind of along the same lines of uh, working with our internal pen test guys, uh, we did a rotation with them and saw that Eternal Blue was having a number of issues. So uh, uh, I definitely spent some time on that, trying to make uh, a lot of the, uh, the edge cases of Eternal Blue be a little bit more stable. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got a little bit more improved error logging. And it's, it's, it's an exploit that unfortunately will sometimes crash the box, but now we actually have an alert in there that if we know that uh, that LSAS is crashed, like we'll at least tell you. Okay. Uh, so hopefully that'll be. Yeah. By the way, you should call the client now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and still a few more, but uh, I, I won't uh, won't spend too much time on these. Just that if you uh, forgot your Windows license key, we have a module for that. So, oh, that's yeah. really useful. Right. Yeah. I, I, again, that's one of those places where you, you end up going to those funny sites and. Right. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> no. no. Only, only Brendan does that. Only, only Brendan does that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then a couple of enhancements for uh, for framework, uh, which actually there's quite a few. I'm only calling out a handful of them here. Uh, but uh, my favorite is always have completion. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think that's one of the one of the main reasons why a lot of people use nice plays. Just it's like the tab completion, so right? It just yeah, has so much of it. I'm sure that that's all. That's the only reason why there's there's none of these other you know stage interpreter on Mac OS X. Oh man, the binding yeah. pipes are so cool. You yeah. can like totally hide your shell and uh, and no one can see it. Yeah, I love. Okay, I guess we go back one. I want to talk about oh, yeah, one way. Like, so you see that last one, multi handler gracefully exit with disabled payload handler. So. Um, you know, this is one of those cases where when you hit this problem you'll and you figure it out, you'll just want to like bang your head and, <laughs> against, uh, I don't know, some sort of belt center or something, but eh, that's too much. Um, but, but basically, multi-handler is an exploit that isn't an exploit. It just runs a payload handler. But we also have a global option that disables the payload handlers. So what happens when you run the exploit that isn't an exploit and just is a payload handler and disable the payload handler? Nothing. <laughs> so uh, this happened like three times in a week. Three different people said, this was not working anymore. And and it, and it, I did it to myself in the process of testing this. Also made this always stop working. And I had no idea why. So now I actually print an error message and says, hey, dummy, you actually just disabled everything. So why don't you just turn something on? Yeah. And it so, yeah. So, <laughs> All right. Little uh, anti-head uh, kind of thing. Very cool. Help us help you. Yeah, right, right. right. Uh, so definitely a lot of cool things this week, uh, but I want to go ahead and kind of put it to the teams and give them an opportunity. Um, I don't see way. I don't know if Adam did you want to. Oh, there you go. Very excited to be back. Ninja. Yeah. Ninja way. Coming in from the trap door. Want to come over here, way? Yeah. I'm good. Always. Well, we have a little over here now. Yeah. Oh, so the internal blue robbery improvement. That's something I did. The was that exception like um, yeah that was uh there were, there were like six different little edge cases <laughs> that the internal blue could fail mm -hmm. um and so some of them were things we could even recover from mm -hmm. so we were failing at times that hey we could actually save this and then there were a couple of yeah okay maybe you know the target uh, got disconnected in the middle of the, the session yeah, good Just, catch you remember there was like a lot of testing involved oh my yeah. god finally we could use up arrow banner up arrow banner yeah <laughs> uh, basically i'm just like good luck <laughs> godspeed uh, the next thing that we have done was the evaluation workshop, um, mainly focusing on the static checks. Uh, has anybody um, not tried this? If, if you haven't tried this workshop, there's like a VM, there's like a PDM, whatever, so you can uh, you can uh, definitely try it out yourself. And I will say we spent a, just a boatload of time just making the, the PDF. There's so much detail. I mean, you, it, it, it's absolutely worthwhile to follow along with the exercise. But there's so much information in there to begin with. 
that it's it's a fantastic use of your time. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've also done some work on spam detection. Um, um, just uh, there's you know especially like artificial intelligence that sort of thing, and just, just trying to get a hang of what, what's what kind of what's a good sweet spot to kind of improve your, your odds of you know getting your email in someone's inbox, and that's not easy to do. Um, like and, finding out some like a, something we should have known before. Like for example, we disabled user from uh, using the spam, right? That actually hurt. We could have allowed yeah. spamming. And then allow one of us just to pull the uh, email from spam out. That helped tremendously. We could have done that, but you know, we learned it after reading Google paper. Right. Yeah, we've done. Uh, surprisingly, Google uh, uh, publishes their their research on you know machine learning algorithms and that sort of thing on their own on their own database. It's like this research.google.com yeah. or something, and you can read all about it. They also have like blog posts and sort of thing. They're quite open compared to other companies about what they do with uh, machine learning. So it's pretty cool. Um, the SSH backdoor shell, I believe that's a uh, Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, I'm not actually familiar with that one. Okay. But uh, kind of familiar with the, the one Jacob that's been working on. Uh, Which hopefully we get a demo of later. Yeah, we're gonna have a demo <laughs> later with some now. Yeah, to him. Um, Netgear. That's also something that we'll did. Um, yeah, we talked about that one earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Very cool. Thanks. Uh, so, our, our our resident script kitties. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the first things that we're gonna mention is something I completely forgot that we even did in this recent one. Oh yeah. Uh, some changes to. Baseline Builder, as you know, you can use Baseline Builder to create an entire test range. Uh, recently, we pushed out some tools that go with VMware automation where you can manage services on Windows machines Ooh. across that entire range. So if you launch, if you stand up all 26 VMs that we support, you can then go through and launch a script that will, for example, disable SMD1 on all of those 26 simultaneously. So you don't have to log nice. in and do it. It'll also take a snapshot. So if you wanted to get them to be all with SMB version one turned off, snapshot it to a specific name so that you can roll it back. I think currently we support uh, SMB one, uh, UAC bypass. Uh, this is for toggle on and off. Mm -hmm. uh, auto login, um, update. Oh, turning on and off Windows Defender and updating Windows Defender to the latest uh, version of. The definitions. Very nice. Um, so I maybe next time we'll demo that. Who knows? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, another nice thing about that is it also adds. Uh, um, it's also written in a, in a in a fairly scalable way to where you can actually, if you don't have a lot of resources, you can have it spin up one or two VMs yeah. at a time as it does this. Or if you got a whole bunch of resources, you can tell it, "Hey, have that. Here's a hundred threads." Um, uh, and go do your work. So there's there's a, a, a lot of capability in there that allows you to kind of time that to the functionality that you need. Yeah. And it's it's uh, fairly extensible. Basically, it works off of a JSON file. So if, for example, a lot of the stuff is you just have to run a given command to, to turn off SMB1 uh, or change a registry uh, value. Uh, you can do that by simply adding that command or registry value into the JSON file and create your own uh, command you want to do. In addition, it also supports one of them is more tricky and it involves a, a Windows script. So basically you hand it a Windows script and it's smart enough to say, oh, you want to run this Windows script on every single VM. A batch file? Yep. Okay. A uh, batch file. This particular one is a visual basic script. Hmm. But a batch file would work, a Python script would even work to run on all of the VMs uh, in however you feel like doing it. Um, also, uh, finishing up testing on command exe test, that actually should land in the next couple hours. Um, added reverse uh, TCP RC4 payload tests and are continuing to do encrypt all the things. <laughs> um, landed that ASUS WRT uh, RCE. Jeffrey, did you have anything? Um, one more thing we added recently that's, uh, that, that's not really up here, but we, uh, we should call it out is that in framework now, uh, whenever a PR is posted, we actually have a new set of tests that are running that are doing uh, a sanity check. 
against the standard Windows Interpreter payload just to make sure that you didn't break the basic testing functionality of the payload itself. Um, what that's doing is it's using the entire automation framework and it's going out, it's actually starting up Windows Interpreter and running the tests modules that exist already in the repository against that at, uh, remote system in the interpreter to make sure that we don't break things. We, we actually added this because recently we actually committed something that broke our ability to upload and download files uh, to interpreter and we decided, you know, this told us that we did that, so let's make it tell us every time someone does that. Yeah. And something else that's kind of fun, um, you may remember the GitHub uh, basically disabled TLS 1.0 and 1.1 in the last couple of weeks, which and is a great move forward for security. Uh, this also had the side effect of breaking half of our build infrastructure because uh, we intentionally built Metasploit on a lot of old virtual machines so that the resulting binaries work on a lot of different OS versions, but they all were old enough to only have TLS 1.0 or 1.1 support, and uh, thus uh, Jeffrey did an amazing job, and so did Chris Gowdy and, and others um, who I may have missed, um, got all those machines updated with newer versions of curl and everything else. Um, I think there was a funny thing about you couldn't even install packages via homebrew, because homebrew downs all, downloads all the source code from GitHub. Yeah. So you, you had a chicken and egg sort of problem there, right? Oh, yes, yes. Homebrew itself is actually hosted in GitHub, um, and all of, and homebrew core, and most of the actual homebrew modules. Um, so a, a lot of that actually has to be updated manually um, in your root environment before you can actually get brew to start using the things that are now in the system environment to go install its own things so that it will then use its own things. So in the future. Turns, <laughs> yes. It turns into a nice uh, a, a nice painful circle. Yeah, but aren't you glad the NSA wasn't spying on you the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> All right, unless they were. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> They're just in the closet anyway. So it's not a big deal. <laughs> All right. Uh, abnormal form. Um, can they hear me from back here? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Step up a little bit. Speak up. No, speak up. Um, let's see. We, we have been doing tons of conversion on the existing uh, data model, um, getting them to work with the new REST API. Uh, we completed hosts and loot and working on services right now. There's a PR up for that. Um, and also columns is uh, in the works. Uh, uh, Chris is getting everything ready that we have right now to be PR to master so we can actually get some Metasploit 5 stuff into the Metasploit 5 branch um, <laughs> that everybody's using. Um, that's a lot of work, so it's it's taking some time, but we want to make sure we do it right. We don't want to just throw one big PR up there and, and say, good luck. Um, We're going to call it GitHub again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what else? Yeah, I, oh, we also standardized the error handling. Um, it's kind of, you know, just doing puts, really bad stuff. You know, fast POC, get, get the, the code working things uh, for error handling, and now we actually have real error handling in it. Does error like, it, does, it works how it should. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's it. Uh, another thing you might want to be worth mentioning was the PR that you put up about uh, changing the way we actually do brute forcing in certain environments for username oh. um, versus password. Oh, um, yeah, that was. Uh, I have a PR up right now for the O login module. Um, uh, working with the internal pen test team, they said a common thing they do um, to help with like lock, lockouts and stuff is they do what's called a password spray <laughs> instead of a, just a normal brute force. So now all of the brute force. Uh, any module that uses uh, the auth root um, library uh, can um, do a pa has a password spray option where it'll go through instead of going user one password one user one password two user one password three it'll not go password one user one password one user two password one user three so that way um, you don't lock out a user if they have um, you know like a fast lockout policy. Um, what else? Did I add? Timing. Oh yeah, the, yeah, that's right. There's, now you can add, uh, do a delay in between the um, users themselves. So each time you would get through uh, a password or a user, it'll wait uh, X amount of minutes until, um, and, then, and then just start it up again. So it's kind of a set it and forget it. A lot of them complain that they would have to do that manually, and they would forget, and then you waste like an hour or two of um, of brute forcing time because it was 
so you just forgot to run the script again. So then that, that's all built in. And it will actually apply that either way. If you're doing password, doing things based on password key, or if you're doing things based on user key, it will allow you to put that timer in. So if you're looking at an individual user and you want to run through their password, if you want to run through their passwords, now with that timer in place, you can delay for every attempt at a password, allowing you to enforce that there's no way you can hit their laptop timer. Hmm. Um, something that framework did not do before. That's really useful. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was over with the, the Plintus guys, I think it was a few weeks after you were there, James, and, and they were still excited about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was good to hear. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, Flatlanders. Yeah, right on. Good stuff. Uh, I've been. I'll talk to the Swift Keylogger stuff. There's, so as we mentioned, there's a video up on YouTube now. That people can go check out and see a little explanation and demo of it. Um, it's currently there's a framework PR and payload PR. Uh, big thanks to Tim Wright for his uh, comments on those. Um, so looking forward to that being uh, landed soon. And uh, that, it's not on there, but I'm working with uh, Rage LT Man right now on a PR that he has out to help uh, convert our Windows uh, C interpreter over using WinPCAP. So that's good stuff. Deb, you want to talk a little bit about Ruby SMB? For uh, bringing in uh, Ruby SMB into the uh, uh, SMB client in Metasploit, uh, I set up a bunch of automated uh, integration tests using the script kitties mentioned. Uh, testing framework. It's very easy to set up tests for any exploit uh, or auxiliary SMB related module um, for several platforms. Uh, so that was cool. And a uh, new contributor to Ruby SMB, uh, user error exists, uh, uh, added some name pipe improvements, the ability to peak. This was for uh, his, uh, for future enhancements to his bind named pipe uh, payload. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. All right, so that brings us to the best part, the demos. Uh, <laughs> very cool. Uh, Mr. Jacob, our, our, uh, your honorary first uh, Metasploit demo meeting demo. May, may the demo gods be with you. If you want to share your home screen. OK, so get stack. RCE, um, there is a exploit DB module uh, that takes advantage of a few bugs to get ultimately RCE. Uh, it, they didn't kind of mention what the preconditions were, so during testing, I had to kind of figure out that um, certain things were required, such as a web interface for uh, the repository view had to be enabled, and then a person had to be assigned to the repository for. Uh, code execution to get to the vulnerable part of code. Um, so I'm going to set the verbose option because this kind of shows uh, the different checks that are being performed, and hopefully this will work. Um, please work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the first check is kind of if, if the web interface is disabled or not, if repositories are available or not, um, and then kind of Enable the repository. If it's not enabled, um, like I said before, the repository has to have a user assigned. So if one's not assigned, it will assign that user to the repository, um, create one if necessary, and then send the payload afterwards. It looks like the user is randomly generated each time. Yeah, it's just like five, uh, five alpha characters. Mm -hmm. And then after the Boom. payload gets sent, it also cleans up all the changes that it makes. Ooh. And we've got a shell. And we got a shell uh, right. system. Ooh. Yeah, it was system. Bang. So kind of another another thing to add on to this is that there's this data file that gets generated. Um, so if you want to crack some passwords for the local users, they'll be right there as well. You can just wow. save us some time and tell us what your passwords are. <laughs> <laughs> that's very cool. Uh, and then so that's kind of all that I had. There's also the uh, REST one, but it's kind of just making um, unauthenticated REST API requests to retrieve users that are available uh, and repositories. Um, so kind of similar code for that one. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. Yeah, bravo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what All right, Adam. All right. Uh, so while I was watching all of these demos, um, I realized that I had a demo from last time that I didn't present that was also 
uh, pretty short, so I will be presenting uh, both my demo from a month ago, if I can remember <laughs> fully and replicate it, um, and uh, the robot scanner. So part of the impetus for doing the uh, modules in Python, or at least running as a separate process from Metasploit, uh, no matter which language they're in, is to get a lot of the heavy work that a module might have to do, like spinning up thousands of sockets or something outside of the thing that you're interacting with so that you won't lock up the core of Metasploit even when you're trying to scan the internet or a particularly large internal uh, or whatever. Uh, so here's an example of that uh, where we've got the ATT uh, Open Proxy, uh, which is one of the uh, new modules uh, written uh, using our new uh, probe scanner, uh, which sends a uh, request and it looks for a response. And using the magic of Python 3 async IO, it does this very quickly, uh, very efficiently. And so I've got a bunch of servers. Uh, when you're scanning the internet and you find an HTTP uh, keep alive server that will have. Uh, keep, keep a lot on even when it gives you an error. Uh, can kind of slow down some scans uh, while you're waiting for results. And so I've got one of those uh, to sort of simulate running into a bunch of really uh, sticky traffic. Uh, and then I've got SOCAT uh, emulating the correct response uh, in a different, uh, listening to a different IP. And so we can see that running, I guess, slash 22 here, it's a little slow. We find the one that matches and then we run into a bunch of invalid IDs. And then after all the uh, timeouts, uh, we finished getting that slash 22 in basically the amount of time it took uh, to time out all those connections. That was pretty darn fast. Uh, which is a lot faster, yeah, than yeah. Metasploit can do it. And we can see Ooh. using the bulk scan. Metasploit just did it. Yeah. Metasploit just did it. This is Metasploit. <laughs> the future is now. <laughs> um, and you'll see that uh, we even get a fancy little uh, Vols report inside Vols telling us what exactly was broken. Awesome. Um, and then the other reason we like having modules or the capability to have modules that are in Python um, is uh, whenever a proof concept comes out that may be a little difficult to port. Um, and we want to have coverage for it, but we don't want to spend the time porting something that relies on Python 3 cryptography library and does a whole lot of big integer stuff uh, and is maybe written uh, from a very proof of concept point of view to where porting it uh, and feeling good about the code that we ported would take a fair bit of effort to rewrite the proof of concept when really we just want to scan for a bug that will probably only be around for a year or two. Um, all of the fun public endpoints have actually been patched. So, is Walmart been patched already? Walmart was patched actually pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and so was Experian. Yeah. I checked this morning. Yeah. So, Your good content. on them, I guess, but <laughs> makes my demo a little bit more lame since I have to uh, go against. Uh, so, Erling for a while was vulnerable. Uh, in this, a uh, particular bug targeted a bunch of uh, SSL implementations that were not OpenSSL. So OpenSSL fixed this bug back in 1999 or so. Um, but OpenSSL has a number of other problems. Uh, and so people wrote their own SSL stats. And so while they weren't necessarily vulnerable to Heartbleed because they remember to check bounds, uh, a more subtle attack like this, a lot of them were vulnerable to. Uh, including Erlang, there are a bunch of CVEs there. Um, and so I've got an older version of Erlang uh, running against this, and yep, you can see that it does indeed have the Oracle. And if you check volumes again, you may see that we have the Black Bar Oracle now. Nice. Yep. Cool. Very cool. Thank you, sir. Adam, do you want to take an opportunity to shamelessly plug the talk and James have to say? Oh, yes. Um, if anyone watching this will be at B-Sides Austin, 
uh, James and I will be talking about the combined efforts to move things away from Metasploit console classic into the future. And it's called Metasploit minus Metasploit because we're going to be talking about the APIs that we're all developing. And that even if you remove all the code uh, in the future, hopefully we would still have a framework uh, of APIs and things that are not Rapid7 owned that can still talk to each other uh, without needing a giant one and a half million line Ruby brushes. Very cool. Looking forward to Friday at 3.30. Yeah, yeah Friday at 3.30 is the last talk slot. I hope. Oh, okay. That was the last talk. Yeah. All right. Uh, and I think our last time up, Brent, you had uh, yeah. SSH shell support? Yeah. All right. So a project I worked on um, last, actually, we've worked on this on and off for maybe a couple of years. It's another one of those sort of elusive issues that have been around for a while, but the, the solution wasn't always clear. Um, but the, the main issue is um, when you use SSH to connect to a remote host, some hosts, uh, SSH is a really cool protocol that allows lots of different what we call channels to be created. A channel is basically like a data stream. You have send it in, send it out, and you're basically pushing re send and receive data. Um, there's different kinds of diff uh, data streams you can create. Um, one kind is called like an exit data stream. Basically, you can tell it, run a command, and it'll run the command and basically connect you to it. You can interact with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Metsploit has actually used that for its SSH login scanner since the beginning of time, oh, yeah. at least from 2009, which is when time started. Um, and <laughs> so, uh, because it used that, it would basically try to guess sort of what kind of shell you had. Like, you know, SSH and something you want to be able to say, to be in bash, something like that. Um, and a lot of modules could actually specify that as an option. Um, however, there are a lot of devices that you implement SSH, but they don't actually implement um, bin SSH. So, they implement a literal command that's the shell. Instead, maybe you log in and you have like a Cisco IMS prompt, or maybe it's a Juniper router, or some sort of embedded device where your shell is not really a Unix shell, but it's just a shell in quotes. So it turns out uh, there was a way to just simply ask your remote device for a shell, and the device would figure out what that means to oh, it. Um, and so it's easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there was a built in channel type for this particular thing. So the problem is, Metsploit, the uh, SSH login scanner, for the longest time, couldn't actually log into any embedded device, and I'll show you what would happen when you would actually try. Um, let's start with an old version of the exploit. And we're just going to go ahead. Um, I actually I have it already targeted against a, um, a Cisco embedded lights out management device. And so I've got a, uh, not a Cisco, Oracle. Okay. So I've got a big Oracle server running at home. Um, luckily, you can run this part without turning on all the fans and annoying your wife. Um, but um, <laughs> Well, I mean, that's part of the reason why you don't run Oracle servers in your house. Yeah. Um, that's the only <laughs> reason. The only <laughs> we can see here the, the session, it tried to log into the session and immediately died because of EOF error. Because basically the remote thing said, I don't actually have a shell to run, in, so I'm going to just die. So um, let's go ahead and check out the latest code upstream master. Oh, let me try to actually check it out. <laughs> And we'll go ahead and start Metsploit a second time. And I'll show you what you get when you actually have, uh, you actually ask the remote host for a shell. So you just say run. And this is the same module. Did you remember to add please to your request? I did not. Oh, That's okay. the next time. Yeah. yeah. But still. But now you can see I actually had a session. Yay. And if I try to interact with it, um, I can see now it's the Oracle Integrated Lights Out Manager. So now I can type LS, and if I do want to uh, you know, make, make my wife uh, upset at me, I can type uh, enable. <laughs> so let's see what this is. Uh, I don't know, I forget the command exactly, but basically we can turn on the server and then they'll call me and say, why is the vacuum cleaner on? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Very cool. So now um, we actually now have support for uh, logging into Juniper devices as well and enumerating all the default passwords people have on their Juniper routers. And we go to this. And I believe um, Will uh, enhanced his backdoor module from a couple years ago as well to be able to give you a session um, instead of just telling you that yes, no, I got to log in. Cool. So there you go. Understanding. Well, I know we're kind of running short on time. Is there anything else anybody wanted to mention in the last few minutes? I just, I just had a question about the, the modifications to the SSH login. Did we look and see how that applies to um, uh, to iPhone devices? Um, there was an issue six months, a year ago, um, where uh, in the, ori the original uh, exploit we have that actually launches an iOS connection um, expects the shell to be in one place, and they've moved it lately, and 
Yeah, this fixes that. that. This does it. Cool. Yeah. So uh, as part of this part of this fix, I also audited all the modules that hard coded a shell and removed all the hard coded shells from all the ones that didn't need it. So now they don't need it anymore. Now it automatically just asks the remote host, "Hey, where's your shell?" And you just get one instead. There you go. Awesome. All right. Last call. Anybody? Comments? Comments? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent.